So, let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Erik Oheim. I'm here. For, I'm studying here at the IMSD at EOI. And um, today, I would like to do with you guys a workshop around respons about responsible consuming. And believe it or not, today is the World Day of the um, Consumer Rights. So it's the International Day of Consumer Rights. I didn't plan it like that. So this is today the perfect time to do this thing. So you can remember it. Um, we all hear about all the theories to be responsible, to be sustainable, how to, be, how to do it. And of course, we all expect a lot of things from the company parts and from the governments. And someone else should solve the problems. But uh, now I would like to show you that also we, as one person, each of us, could do something to be more responsible. And uh, that's why I would like to show you today a more practical approach. And uh, in the first part, I would like to present you some information and um, some tips. And in the second part, we would like, uh, I would like you to work in small groups to share personally some ideas or some problems we could maybe uh, work on. And um, in, the, in between the two parts, you can uh, also taste some uh, responsible food from the buffet and uh, we have from some sponsors. And I will also ask uh, one of our sponsors uh, from Ecosecha Javier in the, in the break time to um, explain to us what is Ecosecha. Okay, um, so as I told you, uh, even if we are not part of a company, even if we don't owe or work for one yet, uh, we are part of the economy as everyday consumers. So why not to be part of the green economy? What can we do to be part of the green economy? Um, let's see. This is a very uh, simple model of how the consumption can influence uh, production. This is, a, this is a circle, so both parties are influencing each other. But that means that we also, consumers, have power to change, to request, to demand the producers to, to uh, have responsible products and to behave responsible. Um, also, one of my uh, personal uh, heroes, Jane Goodell, told me that, uh, told everyone, um, but I also have a personal contact to her, uh, that uh, whatever you do makes a difference. And you decide what kind of difference um, you want to make. So today we will uh, see some solutions and hopefully after uh, this uh, workshop you can make the right decisions. Um, okay, why be responsible and why is it uh, interesting this topic also right now in Spain? Um, I don't know if you're aware of the ecological footprint uh, expression. Basically, the ecological footprints very simply measures the bioproductive uh, area. It can be land or seaside, uh, which uh, required to sustainably maintain uh, the consumption in that area. And the other one is the biocapacity, is the capacity of uh, an area to provide resources uh, for this consumption. And as you can see, in the case of Spain, biocapacity is here and the footprint is here for Spain. That means at least three and a half times higher, bigger than the biocapacity, which means again that uh, Spanish people would, me would need three and a half bigger Spain to realize uh, this lifestyle, this consumption, this request of natural resources. So maybe this is also a reason why uh, we should think about uh, more responsible also here in Spain in Spain. I know there are also worse uh, areas in the world, like we always think in the US, but uh, also in Europe there are, there's room for improvement. Mm. There are some definitions. Uh, you are all aware of what does it mean responsible and uh, sustainable, uh, but this is interesting that also the UN uh, deals as an important topic with sustainable consumption. So they also realize this is something which is important to mention. 
Uh, I wanted to show you um, an interesting video and pay attention because uh, then I would like to ask you if you understand it. Don Coco, ¿cómo le va? Buen día. ¿Qué partido tenemos hoy, eh? Hola, Maretti, buen día. ¿Cómo le va? Un partido crucial. El mundo se juega a su destino. Juegan sustentable y con su mismo. Mire cómo están las hinchadas. La hinchada de sustentable es una cosa de locos. Qué algarabía. Pero la hinchada de consumismo está imparable. Qué partido, Don Coco, que está por arrancar, eh. Mira al referir la moneda y gana, consumimos el sorteo. Este es un partido que se juega por las futuras generaciones. Y arranca el partido nomás, la toca contaminación que va para capitalismo, que juega de una para corrupción. Consumimos está imparable, un aluvión de fútbol, tiró. ¡Qué disparo! ¡Se salva sustentable! Arremete capitalismo que deja dos rivales en el camino y se la pasa a trabajo esclavo. ¡Tiró! Gol de trabajo esclavo. Trabajo esclavo es arrollador, no lo para nadie. Pasa con facilidad e impunidad por encima de todo. La lleva corrupción, se acerca el arco rival. Comercio justo lo marca sin falta. Corrupción se tira a la pileta, no hay falta, don Coco. El árbitro con un final, una vergüenza. El referí está inclinando la cancha para consumismo. Se tiró claramente a la pileta, esto es increíble, impresionante. Toma carrera corrupción, tiró, atajó dignidad, atajó dignidad, sí señores, qué enorme dignidad, pilar de este equipo. Pero este partido no termina, Don Coco, porque el consumismo sigue metiendo, Guerra comete una falta terrible contra conciencia, tarjeta roja, referí, el referí no cobra nada, sigue el juego, sigue el juego como si nada. La lleva petrolera que se la pasa a contaminación, pero medio ambiente lo marca, consigue sacarle la pelota. Se la pasa reciclable que avanza con fuerza demoledora. Toca con orgánico. Esta se la devuelve a medio ambiente. Peligro de gol. ¡Ta, ta, 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 gol! ¡Gol! ¡De medio ambiente! Sigue el partido. Es impresionante el desparramo que está siendo sustentable. La toca compromiso con conciencia que cuando se junta con comunidad no hay individualismo que lo pare. Avanza sustentable y esto es una fiesta. Es ahora o nunca. Va a patear conciencia. Okay, so the question is, do you also play this game? And on which part, which side are you? Um, do you remember any of the players' names? Some? Corruption. Corruption, okay, we start with the bad guys, of course. <laughs> War, okay. Environment. Okay, environment. War. War. Okay. What? Dignity. Dignity, very good. That was, I think, in the Recycle. goalkeeper. Recycle. Recycle. Organic. Organic. What else from the back? Did you see anything? Slave. Yeah, slave, slave work. So I think these are all expressions we are aware about, we are aware of, but um, and we know in theory that they are bad and they are good. But do we really consider them in our decisions? That's the question. <laughs> Let's go fur uh, further. The first question is buy or not to buy before we go in responsible consuming. We can also decide not to buy, not to consume. Um, so are you always, um, are you always weak, for example, against the promotions? Because I used to be, I always wanted to uh, try everything which was, um, adverted, but uh, nowadays I, I think uh, longer about it. And uh, the other question, do you buy always only what you need or do you buy more? 
because different uh, reasons, but we know about food waste, that it's a huge problem also in Spain. Uh, in Spain, there is a data that from the people, so not considering the restaurants and the shops, Spanish people threw away 20% of the food they buy. And uh, this uh, would mean um, 60 kilograms per person per year. Just imagine 60 kilograms of food we just threw away, which could have been eaten or could have served for other reasons. And uh, in um, related to Spain, this is 11 million euros per year in Spain, or 3 million tons of food which will be faced, wasted. So we should really think about it, buy or buy enough, what is enough and not too much. Okay? Have, has um, anyone had this experience that you bought too much because it looked so good in the supermarket and then at the end of the week you, oh, I didn't have time to cook for it or I didn't have, so I had to waste. Be careful, just like go with a list in, in the shop. Like I need that, that and that in this amount. These are little tips. I know uh, one by one we, don't, we cannot change the world, but exactly one by one we will change the world. Um, so the, and also because food waste is, is wrong, because uh, we, to produce food, we need water, we need uh, special resources, we need also human resources, and then we just throw away. So that's uh, not only food waste, but waste of other resources. So if you don't buy, what can you do? Do it yourself. Um, have you thought about um, if you can do something like in regarding for food? Uh, for example, I just tried uh, planting something in my window. I don't have a garden here, uh, but you know, I tried to reuse my yogurt uh, plastic uh, little things and, and uh, plant some species. But you can do some more on a big balcony or in your garden. Or um, you can also cook more. You can uh, do uh, cakes, cookies, um, and this is also good because you know what is inside. You don't use so much uh, plastic packaging, and um, you know it will taste how you like it. So I hope afterwards you will like my cake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where to buy? This is also a big question. So if we go, where to go? But for that, I also wanted to show you a video. Hi, welcome to Gecko Online. In this lesson, we'll talk about food and how what we choose to eat affects not only our health, but the health of the planet. For those of us who are lucky enough to get three meals a day, we'll eat about 100,000 meals each in our lifetimes. That makes our choice of what to eat one of the most far-reaching decisions we can make. So let's take a closer look at those three meals and figure out where they come from, the impacts along the way, and how we can make better choices for ourselves and for the planet. Most of us don't really even need to think very hard about where our food comes from. The store, the restaurant, okay, the farm if you insist. But for most of human history, nearly everyone had to think about where food came from. That was their job. 95% of society revolved around food and its production, leaving 5% for everything else. But the way we produce food now actually flips those numbers around, leaving very little concern about how we get our food, but just that we can afford to eat it. While we were looking the other way, food production changed and our diets changed with it. Traditional diets and farming methods that sustained our health and environment for generations are now being replaced with processed foods and factory farming. On top of that, we have to produce a lot more food than before to feed the extra 5 billion people added to the population in the last century. Because of the changes in our food production and the sheer amounts we have to produce, we are causing negative impacts on our health, environment, and society as a whole. Our food system is unsustainable, complex, and layered. So let's go ahead and just start the first meal of the day with breakfast. It doesn't matter whether you prefer to eat eggs, meat, cereal, rice, bread. All of this food today originally comes from grain. And that even includes the eggs and the meat, as chickens, pigs, and cows are usually these days raised on diets of grain. In our century, the population doubled and tripled, and that meant we needed to start producing a lot more food. We did that by developing remarkable technologically advanced farming systems with the ability to produce huge amounts of grain in really short growth periods. The U.S. has actually become the leader in these technologies and is the world's biggest producer, growing 40% of the world's corn. 
Fields of corn are grown and used for human, animal, and even industrial consumption. That means corn is no longer just the corn on your plate. It's used to do things like produce ethanol, lipstick, sealant, tires, high fructose syrup, and hundreds of other products that are exported globally. Due to all the fertilizers and pesticides to make the corn grow, we're actually killing all the tiny microorganisms needed to keep the soil healthy. And this is a system that is now being adopted in fast developing nations like China and India. All this production matters because it's you eating that egg, bacon, or cereal for breakfast. You, the consumer, eats food grown in poor soil. It's logical that poor soil produces nutrient-deficient crops, and that can only produce nutrient-deficient people. Because we're moving further and further from our true source of food and adding preservatives and additives to allow them to sit on shelves before we buy them, we're actually making the matter even worse. So can we even avoid all these problems, maybe just by not eating breakfast? Absolutely not. It's the most important meal giving you energy for the day. But it's what you choose in the morning that can make a difference. You might consider eating fresh local fruits and maybe avoiding as many packaged breakfast items as you can. Okay, so now it's lunchtime. You're probably sitting in the office and thinking, hmm, what could be a fast and healthy lunch option? Let's say you choose a tomato salad, thinking that's good for your body and the environment. But have you ever asked yourself where that tomato comes from? Chances are it's from a place similar to Almira, Spain, home of the Almira tomato. Much like the corn grown all over the U.S., Almira has become one of the highest yielding environments for genetically modified greenhouse tomatoes. Although it all sounds very unnatural, it is a technology globally used among agriculturalists in Greece, Canada, and America, growing in over 100,000 acres of soilless greenhouses all year round, even though tomatoes are summer fruit. And why is that even happening? Well, there's three things. One, the economies of scale. The more tomatoes that are produced, the cheaper and more competitive their prices on the market. Two, enormous quantities, because people from all over the world want to eat tomatoes at any time of year. And three, people's changes in diets to create this kind of demand. This is not only the case for tomatoes, but most produce that has been carefully studied, groomed, and altered by scientists to create outperforming species of fruit or vegetable that wipes out any desire to harvest an inferior crop. So the more we domesticate different fruits and vegetables to be grown out of season in modified measures that even destroy the soil, whole ecosystems will suffer by taking over from a job that was once in nature's hands. That lunchtime juicy tomato that you thought was healthy could be coming from somewhere very far away. Therefore, it was still unripe when harvested and has lost up to 90% of its nutritional value by the time it reaches your plate. That's why it's important to learn about where the food we order in a restaurant or buy from the shelves in supermarkets comes from. As consumers, we have the right to ask and be informed. That brings us to snack time. Isn't it amazing that we've fallen into this idea that food is a pleasurable fuel to satisfy cravings or relieve stress rather than nutrients that inspire and feed our system? Things like french fries, small sugary milk chocolates, ice cream, candies, these are all great as we know, but they have about a zero nutritional value. Yet we've seen fast food chains and packaged good companies owning more territory globally than most former historical empires. They even have the proclamation of billions and billions served. Food is now marketed based on its alluring value towards satisfying emotional needs and new occasions to eat something that your body doesn't really need. In fact, the top food companies are supporting the development of food substances that look better, are produced faster, but give us consumers very little nutritional value. Pay attention to your next visit to the grocery store. All those colorful variants of the same food, packaged differently, even if they're labeled with things like low-carb, healthy, fat-free, or natural, they're there to seduce your cravings rather than feed you with nutritional goodness as whole foods do. We as a consumer have the responsibility towards our bodies and our health to learn more about the food we put into our systems rather than settle for convenience or image. To counter the fast food movement, Carla Petrini started the slow food movement in 1986, promoting good, clean, fair food for all. He protested outside the Vatican against the way fast food was infringing upon the very fabric of Italian society. And today, it's becoming a global movement from places like San Francisco to Shanghai. Another movement was started by famous chef Jamie Oliver in the UK. He used media attention to draw interest to food issues. In 2004, motivated by the poor state of school meals in the UK, 
Jamie actually went back to school with the aim of educating and motivating the community to enjoy cooking and eating healthy, nutritious lunches rather than the processed foods they were used to. He launched a national campaign on and offline called Feed Me Better and petitioned for better school meals. Both of these initiatives are trying to bring awareness and appreciation for food that every individual, family, local, and even national government can take in order to bring about a more sustainable food system. And they all started with one person. That brings us to the last portion of our lesson, dinner. How about a steak? Did you know that meat consumption worldwide has increased almost three times in the last 50 years? The average U.S. citizen now consumes over 100 kilos of meat per year. In China, the change in a traditionally vegetable-based diet is even more dramatic. The average person 30 years ago only ate 16 kilos of meat per year. Today, that number has more than tripled. We used to assume that the more meat we ate, the healthier and stronger our bodies would be. But is this really true? The best evidence we have actually comes from the China study. For 20 years, they tracked people's eating habits and their health, looking for the connection between the two. They found that people who ate more meat were far more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, and cancer than people who ate mostly plants. In China, people have been thriving for centuries on traditional plant-based diets. And as China has gotten richer, you'd expect that health would improve. But in fact, China's Minister of Health said recently that the number one social problem was that of obesity and diabetes. And it's not just China. As traditional diets in developing countries get replaced with diets rich in sugar and meat, their rates of diabetes are projected to double within the next two decades. But it's not just our health that's suffering. It's the animals in the environment, too. When we think of farms, we picture cows grazing in green, open fields. But actually, the reality is we've started raising animals in a very different way. Thousands of cows are packed together in feedlots, unable to move around. Instead of grass, which their stomachs are specially designed for, we feed them corn and soy, which they can't digest properly. To keep them from dying in these conditions, and to make them grow three times faster than normal, we pump them full of growth hormones and antibiotics. The environment suffers too. Since we need all kinds of space to grow the corn and soy that gives the cows indigestion, we don't have any extra space, so we cut down the rainforest to get it. Clearing land for growing animal feed is already the number one cause of tropical deforestation. As if that wasn't bad enough with what all those cows are eating, their bodies are actually producing methane, a greenhouse gas 20 times as strong as CO2. When you add that to all the greenhouse gases we release growing all that feed, it turns out that raising livestock produces a fifth of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. That's more greenhouse gases than all the world's cars, jets, trains, ships, buses, and trucks put together. So does that mean we all need to become vegetarians? Not quite. Most of us like eating meat and aren't about to give it up. But a diet with less meat in it will be better off for your health and that of the environment. So maybe try a meatless day or two each week and explore other plant-based protein options. You might realize you don't miss meat that much and want to give vegetarianism a try. We're at a point in time where the power of choice and the educated opinion of enough citizens globally can start dictating a new definition and new politics of food. Instead of just eating what corporations put in front of us, we can make our own choices about what we eat. And there's a power in our choices on how that food is made, where it comes from, and how it's produced. Supporting a system that provides nutritious food will bring you optimal health. Nature gives us all the energy and nutrients we need in its simplest form. We need to realize the power of choice we have. Exactly, it's about the power of our choices. Because I'm pretty sure you've heard uh, many things about uh, what we saw just in video already in, from different parts. But it's always good to be reminded because until <laughs> it is not in your uh, head when you make the decision, when you decide where to go to buy and what to buy, uh, until that we need to remind the, uh, people about this. So where to go uh, to buy your food? Perfect would be if you go to a local market for example, close to here is like where I go sometimes, Mercado de Maravillas, if you know it, or to be in contact with the local producers. I know it's not always um, easy, but there are possibilities. You just have to make a search, you have to uh, ask around. Um, and there are also different cooperatives like Ecosecha, 
And for example, they are also delivering here um, fruits and, and veggies, so you can maybe also join the groups and, and get delivered here every week some fresh uh, local produced uh, fruit and veggies. And there's also like uh, another group, uh, Consumo Agroecologico, in Madrid. So, but if you cannot avoid and you have to go to the supermarket, then uh, there is a little help um, which supermarket to go or not to go or uh, which brands to buy. And uh, some of you heard about the red and green guide of Greenpeace. They um, they issuing this every year, a fresh guide. Um, this is about um, gen um, GMOs, transgenic um, parts in the food. So if there is, uh, there is a discussion about it is good or not, but if you want to avoid that in your food there is some transgenic, then maybe you should consider this list. Um, this um, includes companies in green which state, uh, which give out a statement that they don't have any uh, GMOs. And in red, uh, those who we know that use GMO, because in laboratory uh, things it was uh, proved, or they didn't want to answer uh, Greenpeace to the questions. So there might be a question. This is how it looks like. For example, this is a Canadian version. Here are some uh, in red and in green. Maybe I don't want to mention right now any companies or products, but it's, it's interesting to have a look on that and you might be surprised in some of them. Uh, for example, what I made, a uh, short list of those who are not obvious for me and have it in my pocket whenever I go shopping, that not to make a, a wrong decision. Okay, it's also um, important what you buy. There's a lot of possibilities. Okay, whenever you go and you decide you would like to decide for a product, um, do you always check the information on it, on the package or on the product? It would be very important to check if once it's already there, take these five more extra seconds to check where is it from, what does it contain, and any extra like labels or whatever, because it can get you information. Um, so the very the product from, of course, many products have to travel a lot, you know, CO2 emissions, carbon footprint. So can we avoid it? Is there any local alternative? Uh, have we thought about it? And if there is no local alternative, then is it a way we can compensate? For example, uh, with products which, is, which are traded fair, like with fair trade or any other um, um, trade organizations. Um, Let's see also a video about this uh, issue. Every single time we walk into a supermarket, we are bombarded with choices. Tea grown in Asia, coffee harvested in South America, and chocolate picked in Africa. Items on the shelf don't arrive there by magic. There isn't a giant factory that creates them from nothing. People have to grow the food we eat, sew the clothes we wear, and harvest the coffee and tea we drink. I can make your life great. You loser, buy me or you'll be alone forever. Loser, buy me or you'll be alone forever. Pig. I taste trend. Me, me, <laughs> me. Consume. Sorry. Tell me your credit card. <laughs> You are what you do. Eat me. 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 Fair trade. But it 
choose our product? No, I didn't. How are we going to get our money? I mean, our valuable customer back. We could get some of our products accredited fair trade. And for those products, we could offer the farmers a fair deal. We could move towards becoming a fair trade company. Did I ask you for your opinion? The stuff you buy can change the lives of millions of people you will never see. This is done not by charity, but by paying them a fair amount for a job well done. Fair trade provides a label that guarantees people have enough to eat, they can look after their land, and their children can get an education. Okay, but to be fair in Spain, there's not only fair trade, but it's also Comercio Justo on IDEA. So there are different uh, labor certification organizations. So you could, uh, you, sh you could use all of them. That was just like an interesting uh, movie from Fair Trade. But where we were able to see what kind of impacts uh, our decisions uh, have and the products, how they are produced, where they are produced, by whom, under which conditions, under which labor conditions. So I know there are so many things to think about whenever you buy something, but sometimes you should think about it if, if it is worth to pay less or to pay more for something which is more responsible. Okay, uh, what does it contain? Um, since we eat the food, it's getting inside, so it, it has an effect on our health, on our uh, how we feel and so on. We should pay more attention uh, what we eat. Uh, for example, you might know some of these E numbers. I don't know, are you aware which number, what does it mean? Okay, me neither, that's why I was looking for a list uh, which can help me further. Uh, what I found in Spanish that uh, there is a web page uh, which shows all the E numbers and the green ones, because you know E numbers are not all bad, that can be also natural things, the green ones are uh, the good ones and it, they're not uh, poisonous and the red ones um, be careful with those because it has different uh, poisons and different bad effects on, on your health. So, it's, you know, all the products have to have this information which E they uh, contain. So pay uh, attention. Maybe again, you can uh, make a short list from the most poisonous to avoid at least them. Um, we talked about the GMO free. I'm, for example, not uh, in favor for GMO food. Um, organic, um, there are a lot of, uh, lots going on regarding organic. In Europe, 9% of the agricultural land is, uh, is uh, titulated as organic. So we hope it will grow, but of course, until it, not get, it doesn't get affected from the GMOs. And um, why it is, um, sometimes it is, it is uh, more expensive to buy organic food, but why do you have to pay more? We just had uh, the class yesterday when we mentioned that uh, with this uh, little bit extra money, you pay that you buy something less risky. You, you, don't, pay, you don't buy uh, poisons, you don't buy the antibiotica, what they, maybe the other products use, but here in organic you can make sure that it is free, uh, free from all these uh, bad um, ingredients. Okay, uh, since we're in Spain, fish is a very important topic. And fish is good, so you should eat uh, fish because it's healthy. But uh, not all the fish are healthy, one side. And uh, not all fish um, come from a sustainable area. Um, maybe you know that uh, from wild fish from the ocean, 75% uh, of the fish stock is overexploited, is overfished. So it's really not sustainable. So you might think that uh, these um, aquacultures, they would be the sustainable um, alternatives. It could be if they are really sustainable. The problem is that because it's a big business, um, f um, mainly in Asia, but not only in Asia, uh, in Asia, there are a lot of aquacultures which are not sustainable. Just one picture. So would you like to eat a fish from this kind of aquaculture? There is more fish than water inside. It's like, uh, and f to survive um, for these fishes, they get a lot of antibiotica and so on. And then they are delivered to the European market. 
or frozen or somehow. So I'm not sure if uh, I want to eat that kind of fish. What could be the solution? Uh, there are again organization. The famous one is MSC, the Marine Stewardship uh, Council, uh, which, certif which certify uh, fisheries. So there you can make sure that uh, your fish is from a sustainable uh, aquaculture. And also WWF has a guide, uh, also here in Spain, uh, which says which uh, kind of fish is recommended and which is not. So if you want to be a responsible consumer, you might have a look in that guide and uh, have it on mind which fish you should avoid. Okay, certifications. We talked a lot about, there's a lot of uh, organic, green and good certifications. Can you mention some of them? Fair trade, Fair trade yes. FSC, yes. That's for forest. Energy Star. Energy Star, very good for the uh, energy electrical devices. What else? This is MSC, okay, the blue one with the fish. Lead, yeah, and there are some uh, biofuel, bio organic um, products. So there are a lot of certifications. Um, just look, look for them. Uh, food footprint. Why it is important? Because it has a lot of impact, as we know, as you just saw also in some of the videos, uh, what you eat. Uh, this is a comparison from Oxfam, from a report. And, for example, one kilo from beef or chicken or um, I think one, yeah, one kilo from all of these has this kind of impact. Uh, this column is the water footprint. Since uh, we are kind of running out of water, this can be an important um, information. Have you thought that one kilogram of beef uh, needs 15, more than 15,000 liters of water until to get to you? So it, it is uh, worth to uh, think about it. This is the CO2 emission, so the carbon footprint, uh, kilogram um, of CO2. This is the land use, how big land you need. And this is important because we are more and more people on the earth and we need more and more uh, land for the food production. And uh, the areas which suffer are the rainforest. So the more land we use, um, usually the more rainforest we cut down. And also the grain um, for feed the, the animals. So because, of course, we have to um, produce for them the feed, um, something to eat, or we could also eat that. So that's, again, a point where you could think about being not 100%, but a little bit more vegetarian. I know that's hard in Spain, but uh, these are the consequences. You should be aware of it. Okay, how we can uh, do our shopping responsible and what other impacts still um, should be considered? A packaging, you know, whenever you go into supermarket, pre-processed uh, food, uh, there is usually a lot of packaging. And what? It usually it is packed in plastic. In plastic because it is cheap, it is very easy to use. Um, but what does, it, uh, what does happen with plastic once we don't use it anymore? Plastic if it's not a special biodegradable uh, plastic, and the biggest part is not, then it never goes away, or in only uh, 400 years it uh, disappears. So it will stay here, it, uh, and we will see in one video where it stays. Um, one other issue is the plastic bag. Uh, in some countries it's already uh, abandoned, which is great, uh, but we can do kind of uh, voluntary abandoning about that. So please always use something, have in your bag, uh, reusable bags. We already started with this project with, uh, you know, whenever you go to the supermarket, uh, you put your veggies or fruit in the, in the plastic bag. So you can also go with your own bag and, and put it there and then give it to the cashier. Uh, what, like, as students, uh, we are very affected uh, by the coffee cups because at least uh, two, three coffees, depends from where we are, um, we uh, drink a day. So there are a lot of uh, plastic coffee cups uh, are wasted every day. 
for that, it could be a solution, but I and some of my classmates already use uh, this kind of thermos. Uh, you can also bring it from home already. Or um, downstairs in the cafeteria, they are nice people and they put the coffee into your thermos. So you don't need to use these plastic or paper uh, cups. And also for in, to uh, avoid the plastic bottles for water, you could use more and more, also more healthy, uh, these uh, metal bottles. So a uh, short video, a cutted video about why plastic is so bad and so dangerous. This is in all over our rivers and oceans. Where? And river all over. Unfortunately, they don't know what is a plastic bag. They think it's food. And year by year, they get into so small pieces, but they never really disappeared. And these pieces are eaten by the animals. And, and because they are light, they get easily everywhere by the wind. So maybe we should avoid that, that more and more pollution is coming. Um, I really try to um, leave plastic free. It's really hard. Everything is with plastic. But with some friends and with my sister, we came up with a very simple tool, just an Excel, that we face some problems looking for something without plastic. So we put it here. Maybe someone else has a solution for it. So that kind of sharing and knowledge sharing. So that is also kind of what I would like to have uh, afterwards in groups. Mm. Then there is the recycling topic. Uh, this is also a good option, but it should be the last option after the reducing uh, to consume things. Then if you have it already, then pl please try reuse it as many times as possible. And then at the end, recycle. What can be recycled, what not? Do you know how uh, the, the rules are in Madrid? Because in Madrid's um, Ayuntamiento, um, there is a page explaining what should be put in the yellow um, um, waste, uh, what should be in the paper, what should be in the, in the green one for bottles. So it is also accessible uh, on their web page. So not everything can be recycled, so be very well or uh, they need special recycling, like the used oil, what you use in the kitchen, or like electrical devices. So, but uh, the Ayuntamiento, the municipality, uh, gives us also the solution. They have some special points where you can bring that. Okay, so what can you do from today on already, or from tomorrow? Um, there are some tips uh, which you can read. Uh, just to be a more practical, maybe you're already using all these practices, which is great. Uh, but as I, as I told you, it's always good to be reminded every time. Okay, and 
Uh, we just set up uh, with Adrian a um, new website. We would like to give a response um, to today's irresponsible way of, of consumption. And here you can find all the information uh, this uh, presentation contains, all the documents I mentioned, all the links, all the videos. Okay, So that could be an informative uh, source for you also. And uh, we will um, add more and more material to this. Mm. Uh, right now we would change to the second part. And now is the time where I would like to mention two of our sponsors here of our buffet, like Eco uh, They are the cooperative. And Javier will tell you in some words uh, very quickly about how this works. And um, Eco Shop, La Ecologica, um, Tienda close by here. And um, now I would invite you to the buffet and we could listen uh, in the meantime also to Javier. And afterwards we will have uh, maybe three or four groups. Uh, I would like you to stay. It is, it's not, um, you can also speak Spanish if you are not really, you don't want to uh, speak in English. But it is really nice to share some uh, personal ideas, some personal problems regarding this because now is the time, you know. I, uh, to be aware of this. Maybe your neighbor can uh, have a good solution for that. So I would like you to ask to uh, try the buffet and to stay here for the groups. You will have like kind of group leaders, okay? So uh, Javier, podrías venir uh, decir algo uh, mientras la gente podría? Gracias. And in the meantime, you can grab something. Uh, uh. Bueno, pues os cuento muy rápidamente, con el micro se ve que se escucha mejor, vosotros supongo que no. Eh, bueno, pues ya sabéis, se ha pronunciado varias veces, yo soy de la cooperativa de cosecha y un poco, de alguna manera, se ilustra después de esta interesantísima y bien presentada exposición, pues eh, digamos... A mí me gustaría un poco reforzar eh, ese papel de transformación que tiene el consumidor y la consumidora eh, a la hora de hacer las cosas, ¿no? Es decir, o sea, aunque sabemos que, digamos, que hay, una, digamos, hay algo por encima muchas veces nuestra que nos impide movernos exactamente a lo que queremos o que nos determina lo que tenemos que necesitar, ¿no? vosotros que estáis en estas cosas sabéis que bueno, pues no necesariamente todo lo que hacemos es algo que hemos elegido, ¿no? sino que de alguna manera, de unas maneras u otras, se nos ha impuesto. ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues plantear que eso se puede un poco retocar de otra manera y también... Me gustaría un poco contar mínimamente un poco la experiencia nuestra, porque además pues es una experiencia cuando menos empresarial curiosa. ¿no? Es decir, eh, Ecosecha nace hace dos años, en realidad nace, no nace como Ecosecha, sino nace como Ney Sociedad Cooperativa, es una cooperativa que nace haciendo formación en el tema en que nosotros controlamos, que era medio ambiente. ¿no? Y cinco años después decidimos que nos dedicamos a algo productivo. O sea, y nos metimos, dijimos, bueno, en vez, de, en vez de repartirnos los beneficios, que dábamos beneficios, dijimos, lo guardamos, o sea, lo que buscamos es tener un buen sueldo y punto, es decir, vivir bien, o sea, con un sueldo digno y razonable, y a partir de ahí, pues los excedentes cooperativos, que se llaman así en el caso de los beneficios, eh, pues no repartirlos, dedicarlos a hacer actividades productivas. Y en este caso nace el proyecto de cosecha, que ahora se ha comido la cooperativa, es decir, ahora nos dedicamos a esto, no a la formación prácticamente. ¿no? Y, y bueno, la curiosidad es que en un entorno como Madrid, donde no hay prácticamente producción de agricultura ecológica, pues tenemos casi 16 hectáreas en producción, trabajamos ocho personas en la cooperativa, y todo el mundo en la cooperativa, eh, a ver, y voy por, por partes, ¿no? apostamos por la agricultura ecológica porque nos parece lo correcto, nos parece lo lógico, es lo que nos pedía el cuerpo. Muchos de los que estamos aquí militábamos en grupos ecologistas y nos habíamos tirado toda la vida, o sea, yo he estado varias veces en la cárcel de jovencito, o sea, nos pedía el cuerpo pues, hacer lo que habíamos dicho que teníamos que hacer, ¿no? Hacer, y ya bastaba de bla, bla, bla y empezar a hacer un poquito de cosas, ¿no? Y un poquito, tener infraestructura y un poquito de dinero te ayuda mucho, la verdad. Eh, entonces, bueno, eso era natural, ¿no? Nos tenía que venir de esa manera natural. Luego, por otro lado, eh, sentamos en el banquillo al del vídeo, al del, 
al del trabajo esclavo y nos planteamos antes de empezar las condiciones laborales mínimas para hacer el proyecto y no pusimos los sueldos en función de lo que hacíamos sino que lo primero que hicimos fue poner los sueldos y las condiciones laborales y dijimos y ahora hacer cuentas, las cuentas salían muy bien, eran mentiras, o sea, nos hemos tirado seis años hasta descubrir que las primeras cuentas que hicimos no valían para nada y lo único que nos habían acumulado eran pérdidas, pero bueno esto es una, un aprendizaje que se, que, se va, que se va teniendo por el camino, ¿no? pero una cosa muy importante, o sea, nosotros por ejemplo tenemos condiciones laborales no dignas sino súper dignas en el sector, un sector en el que no sé si conocéis, el de la agricultura, donde más del 80% de la, de, los, de la gente que trabaja por peonadas lo hace de forma ilegal, es decir, ni siquiera se paga, se paga eh, digamos, la seguridad social de esa gente. ¿no? Para que os hagáis una idea, los costes laborales medios vienen estando entre 40 y 50 euros día. ¿vale? Ese es el coste unitario laboral de un trabajador en el sector agrario. Nuestros costes laborales son 120 euros, que son bajos, para tal, pero vamos, casi multiplicamos por tres, es decir, los costes laborales. Y aún así somos miliuristas, ¿eh? es decir, no os vayáis a pensar que es que aquí dices, bueno, es que esto tiene un sueldazo. No, normal, lo que pasa es que cobramos 14 pagas, pues como casi todo el mundo, las vacaciones las cobramos, pues las cosas normales, ¿no? Que si estás malo un día y no vas a trabajar también cobras, ¿no? Es decir, cosas que por ejemplo en la agricultura son impensables. ¿Vale? Entonces, bueno, eso fue lo segundo. Lo tercero fue plantear que queríamos un elemento de transformación social, es decir, nos, nos planteábamos hacer agricultura, además con condiciones laborales dignas, y además dijimos, bueno, y además vamos a intentar cambiar el paradigma en el que se asocia el tema de, de, de la sociedad de mercado actual, ¿no? en donde, donde hay unas, unos empresarios que compran unos distribuidores, es decir, tú estás comprando el producto, luego ahí interviene un montón de gente y cuando a ti te llega tú no tienes ni la más remota idea de lo que ha pasado por el camino, no conoces por supuesto a los agricultores ni a las agricultoras, no conoces el proceso, no sabes quién se lleva el dinero, quién no se lo lleva, o sea, bueno, somos perfectos desconocedores del proceso. Y nosotros en ese sentido decidimos eh, que nuestro proyecto se iba a dirigir solo y exclusivamente a consumidores, es decir, venta directa, o sea, toda la producción es venta directa, no hay distribuidores y nos negamos radicalmente a, a entrar en, ese, en esa lógica, que es una lógica que por otro lado, por lo menos en el caso de la agricultura, ha llegado a la ruina a la mayor parte de los agricultores, puesto que siempre, acaba o sea, siempre tienen que reducir un centimito más cualquier cosa y eso les acaba obligando a contratar a gente de forma ilegal, quieran o no quieran, ¿eh? es decir, es... O sea, alguien el otro día me contaba, pues por ejemplo en Almería, ¿por qué no hay inspecciones para que no haya gente trabajando en los invernaderos de forma ilegal? Pues que el gobierno no quiere que haya inspecciones, porque si hicieran inspecciones tendrían que contratar a gente legalmente. Si contratan a gente legalmente, lo mismo el kilo de tomate se tiene que vender 5 céntimos más caro. Que fijaros qué pedazo de precio, ¿no? 5 céntimos. Pero esos 5 céntimos son suficientes como para que el tomate de Almería no sea competitivo. O sea, con lo cual, si tú quieres generar determinada... Es decir, aquí estamos todos mezclados en la historia, pero hay un, digamos, digamos un sistema que fuerza a que esa situación sea así. ¿no? Yo le pongo un nombre que se llama capitalismo, no sé aquí qué tipo de estudios tenéis, pero bueno, nosotros estamos en contra de ese sistema y lo que entendemos es que tiene que haber relaciones directas. ¿no? Y eso es lo que ha determinado que nosotros vendamos solo y exclusivamente a consumidores directos ¿no? y donde se les informa de todas las condiciones, les, les enseñamos la huerta, bueno, un poco buscando esa cercanía entre unos y otros. ¿no? Y bueno, pues eso que nos va bien, vivimos ocho personas de esto, con lo cual incluso puede ser una manera de vivir, ¿no? no solamente de pensar lo que hay que hacer, sino incluso de hacer y vivir de ello más o menos dignamente. Y poco más. Gracias. Muy bien, muy bien. Maybe one person from that group can explain a little bit what you discussed about and your ideas. Any volunteers from the second group? <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, you need the mi micro. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall I? Yeah, it's in Spanish. And... <laughs> as well as it's better, you understand. <laughs> okay, we discuss here um, that it's, it's, very, it's very hard for us to buy things um, with, with less packaging. Because with less? Packaging. Packaging. Mm -hmm. So um, we need we need to find a way to 
to overcome that that problem. Uh, another thing, when when you go into a small shop, uh, local local shop, you find another problem is that you you don't know really where that that product come from. We discussed here in the group that there's a, a law here in in Spain that mm -hmm. that um, obliga by you to um, to show to show all the information about the product you're you're selling but mm -hmm. we're not sure that that is really happening and really what happens happening. if you ask the shopkeeper ah, yeah. okay but it's basically to, to know where it comes from mm -hmm. but they don't have no like mm -hmm. and other thing we discuss is um what else okay we we said that would be a very good idea to have a platform for share all the information very good. that <laughs> that will make we we will make our decisions uh, more more easy easier I mean uh -huh. and and share the the all the the thoughts we have about about the issues we find in in our day by day in in a place all together mm -hmm. like in in a web for example what do you think <laughs> And also, <laughs> yeah, uh, the platform it could be in the style that uh, you show in the simple Excel file, and just to share. For example, if I find uh, a tuna that is certified, I said, "Hey, I found it uh, in a supermarket in a specific one, and you can find as well." Mm -hmm. And the second things that I want to share with you is uh, that we went to Mercado Maravilla mm -hmm. and we asked for the, 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 um, and the salmon where it comes from mm -hmm. and they say from Norway and we say okay we don't buy it <laughs> and uh, the good. person was a bit upset <laughs> 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 uh, yeah in the in the local market, uh, there's n n it's not compulsory to have uh, always mm -hmm. uh, the, the origin of the product. In it's the supermarket, I guess that uh, for the vegetables and for the fruit, uh, there's always uh, mm -hmm. the tag with uh, mm -hmm. it comes from. Yeah. And if uh, it comes from, uh, I don't know, South Africa or uh, South America, usually I don't buy it. Exactly. And, uh, but in the local market, it's quite uh, mm -hmm. uh, struggling mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, mm -hmm. with the seller. Where is the limit of distance for you? <laughs> for me, <coughs> Spain. I mean, Spain, Spain, actually. Uh, for example, if uh, salmon comes from Norway, I don't want to buy it. Uh, if it comes from Spain, it's okay. But <coughs> if I can, uh, I can buy, for example, with the, this kind of stuff that it comes from a local uh, agriculture, that it comes even closer to, from closer to Madrid, it's even better for me. If I can add something in this case, so you mean that we need to, to adjust our uh, our style to the local community. I mean, because salmon, as Carlos said, is not common in Spain. So you need just to to to, okay. to be aware that if you are in a location, you need to to eat what is available there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Norway, it's like uh, the seasonal fruit. And the you just fruit. move to Norway, then you have the salmon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can eat the salmon from Norway. Yes. No, it's like the seasonal uh, fruit yes. and vegetables. So we need to be aware, even um. with the. <coughs> With the other list that you show, we need even to be aware doesn't work that <laughs> 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 you, We need even to be aware what's the product of uh, your uh, part of the world where you are in what that moment. What is local and yeah. what is seasonal. Yeah, yes. it's important. It's mm -hmm. uh, part of awareness of the consumption, yes. mm -hmm. starting from what uh, you can uh, have in that part of the world and uh, the seasonal fruit and vegetables. Mm. I, I would like to add a point because uh, I'm from a country which is the net exporter of agricultural goods to all of the world. So I understand the point of giving preference to local suppliers and uh, support the local production in terms of the mile that the food has traveled, and in terms of that it will be more healthy as well and support the local economy. But we should not. Um, we should be aware that the the the, 
the most the, the worst practice is from the the big supermarkets which buy in bulk <coughs> from other countries <coughs> and they suppress the price and they take advantage of getting a um, better trade um, agreements and they and because they have a bigger um, buying power it they get then they can exploit this this the the producers in other countries but nonetheless uh, we should not shut up shut ourselves from buy something from somewhere else but you have exactly. to be Here aware comes of the role of the consumer of the responsible mm -hmm. consumer are you willing to pay a little bit extra compared to that very cheap uh, food <coughs> to know what is the impact what you make with your this uh, this one decision mm -hmm. no i mean like as long as if you can, if you are buying something, then you cannot find in Spain because it's not produced in Spain anyhow. Mm -hmm. But we know is from has been done through a fair trade, is still good. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, unfortunately, we cannot uh, afford the carbon footprint of the food, but uh, it, it's part of a responsibility. Yeah. If we will, if we close ourselves inward <coughs> in a, in a economically. It just uh, consuming things that are produced here, we affect the world economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is these two sides of the story. Of course. Um, okay, yes. anything else? This group? Any ideas or any additions? I think this group had the same answers as you guys, that <laughs> we were focusing on, on buying local. Another thing we mentioned, though, was that when you do go to the store, you should pick items that have that are packaged in a way that will have less impact, such as picking something that's in a glass and not in plastic. And the biggest thing that we mentioned here was influencing people around you, because uh, we went around and asked how many times we go to the supermarket, do we have a lot of food waste, and we all answered that no, and I think that comes from being aware of the importance of keeping the environment sustainable. And as we mentioned here, you could buy local um, produce from from like Eco Secha, Eco Secha, where you can gather a group of people in your neighborhood or in your building, and you can order from them. And that way, they when they deliver, they cover a lot of people. It's local. And you spread the message to everyone. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's still a question between organic or local. If I can't find it locally, do I, um, like, if I can't find it organic locally, but I find it locally, but like conventional, do I buy it or to, do I take the organic one which one is far? It depends. You play with your own health, could be, um, or you want to support organic uh, producers or not. That's like they locally produced, they might have the same, like the good business practice, mm -hmm. but they're just not certified. Yeah, exactly. It could be. If you know them, if you trust them, if you know what they do and how they do, of course, there could be an alternatives. Mm -hmm. Any other opinion, any other question or information you would like to share? Yes. We mentioned a couple of more things. One is try to go. Oh, yeah. Try to go to the where where the the, the food comes from. Go mm -hmm. to the producer instead of, of buying from from another another one. This is a little bit in contraposition with with what she she said, mm -hmm. but uh, and we also talk about um, yeah influence the people we already mentioned and for for the okay sorry <laughs> and for the the products that don't get uh, don't get wasted no don't get expired expired. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then buy more quantity, so the mm -hmm. package will be bigger and, bigger and, and less 
less am less amount of of packets. Exactly, that's use. a good point. That to avoid package things package each and every little piece of it, that can be harmful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Anything else? If not, then uh, I hope you um, can bring with you something from from this afternoon. Uh, maybe some ideas, or maybe at least that next time, if you go shopping, that you stop for two seconds and think about it, what you buy. Um, otherwise, uh, as we receive your emails, we really would like to send out one uh, email to let you know where you can find this information maybe you would like to look up uh, in the future. Okay? And then thank you very much for coming and participating.